So uh, welcome to Ashby Village um, Science and Ideas. As you know, we are a volunteer group and we always appreciate people coming up with ideas and questions. And um, uh, Roger Newman is going to talk with us today. We're, he's a, a former anthropology teacher at, um, at BCC and before that at Lane, not at Laney, Alameda, um, Grove Merit. Street, Merritt, Merit. et cetera, et cetera. So um, he's also taught all the different subcategories of anthropology, archaeology, social anthropology, physical anthropology, linguistics, and so on. So he's had a lot of experience and has a lot of curiosity about um, evolution and um, language and so on. So he's in a great position to talk to us about one of his pet, pet interests. Um, in this meeting, he's going to pause a couple of times and he's going to ask if you have any comments because we want, it, we want to make this more of a participatory thing than they have been in the past. So um, you can write chats while he's speaking and you can also wait for a break in the in his presentation and then ask a question that way. You need to mute us. Okay, so I will mute everybody. And so then, okay, so now you are now muted, but I will, I would like to unmute Roger. I did, I did. You did, thank you, okay. And Celie, you can be unmuted also. So you're, everybody's going to be muted. And then when it comes time for the breaks, then we'll unmute everybody and you can ask questions and make comments. So we are recording now and um, go ahead, Roger. Okay. Thank you for participating. Right. Okay, thank you, Audrey and Celie. Um, for giving me this opportunity to talk about a topic which uh, I've been interested in for a long time. And one of the things I like about it, I mean, first of all, is the, the story of our uh, human migrations is, uh, you know, just a wonderful topic, but also uh, trying to figure out something that happened uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago uh, is a challenge. And, you know, that's where uh, I think it's so interesting and I'll, um, I'll get into a little bit of the methodology of, you know, how people figure this stuff out. So I'm going to start with um, sharing my screen here. And uh, I've got a little slideshow, which is um, hopefully everybody can um, see the slides. I'll, I'll get out of this when we do the, um, the discussion part. So anyway, this is uh, called Out of Africa, Early Human Migrations, and we're focusing on Australia and New Guinea. And you might say, well, why Australia and New Guinea? Well, um, this was the site of a very early human migration and pr pretty much the first one out of Africa. So this seems odd. Uh, they're far away across water. Um, you know, and the Australians and the people of Highland New Guinea uh, seem really different. Um, and Audrey and I have been to both places and have met, uh, we'll show you some slides of our trips there. Uh, so so uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. Now I've got a little video here, um, which at the risk of a political incorrectness, um, I'm gonna show a video uh, uh, of a Republican speaking and um, this might be something that um, you remember, but um, excuse the fact that he's a Republican. There are reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns the ones we don't know we don't know <laughs> excuse me but is this an unknown unknown uh, i'm not several unknowns and i'm, I'm just wondering i'm not going i'm not unknown. going to say which it is <laughs> you know, i'm right here i'm right here so you can see that uh, rumsfeld didn't really want to answer some questions and everybody uh, thinks that he was just uh, being coy or being a smart ass you know which i'm sure he was 
Uh, but um, the fact is that there's been a lot of surprises in, in our world in uh, recent times. And I just wanted to talk about unknown unknowns. In other words, stuff that came out of nowhere. And, you know, um, you know, in my career, when, we, when I learned about this stuff, it, we called it stones and bones. And so it was a matter of, you know, find a site, dig up, look at the bones, try to figure out how old they were and try to, re, you know, uh, put human evolution together. In, 19, in 2003, we have the completion of the Genome Project um, and also the discovery of hobbits on Flores Island, Indonesia. Some of you may remember this is very uh, sort of a diminutive group of people who are really quite primitive. and um, what what are they doing there? How did they get to Flores Island? It was just kind of out of the blue. Uh, then in 2010, these are just some of the stuff that's happened in recent years of uh, deciphering the Neanderthal genome. You know, first we had the human genome, then um, uh, Svante Pabo and others in the uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany uh, extracted DNA from Neanderthal fossils in Croatia which had been preserved well enough that he was able to put together uh, a pretty complete uh, Neanderthal genome. Uh, in the same year, uh, we discovered a whole new species, Homo uh, Denisova, or Denisova, I don't care how you pronounce it. Uh, these are some, this is a fossil, or not even a fossil, it's genetic, uh, genetically known species uh, from Asia, which uh, actually uh, they have, uh, apparently interbred with the sapiens, the sapiens spread into Asia and into, uh, into Indonesia and, and New Guinea. So th it's a species that's known from a very, very small amount of fossil material, but they were able to get uh, genes out of it. So uh, amazing. And in 2013, we had this uh, spectacle of uh, this cave in South Africa, in what they call the Cradle of Mankind, which I kind of think is a misnomer. But um, they found 1,200 specimens of a new species they called Homo naledi. Now the most interesting, well, not the most interesting, but one interesting thing about it was, it was so hard to get into this cave that the head, the head investigator never got there himself. It was just this tiny little crack and, you know, he had to, so they put out a call for cavers who had a scientific interest. And they had to be small. And so uh, they were all these small women from all over the world who said, oh, I'll go. And they, all six of them, you know, uh, slipped into this cave and collected these specimens. And the, uh, the uh, uh, chief investigator watched on a closed circuit TV, you know, it was pretty amazing. Uh, in 2019, just another recent thing, the, Homo luzonensis in the Philippines, um, another fossil that came out of nowhere. And so we have more and more material to uh, work with. Now on this slide, um, this is, I just wanna say everything that I say here, people can argue about, you know, and anthropologists are known for arguing about every little detail. So I'm not gonna get into the arguments. I'm just gonna give kind of a, a general, picture. I mean, this isn't, um, uh, I'm going to be a little bit unspecific sometimes because I just want to give the big picture of how things happen. So what we see here in Africa 200,000 years ago, these numbers are hundreds of thousands. So at about 200,000 is when we date uh, the first Homo sapiens. Now recently there's been discoveries that push it to 300,000. So this already is a little bit, you know, there's some questions. But at around 70,000 or so, uh, people left Africa and made their way down to the islands of Indonesia and into Australia and New Guinea. And that was the first really successful migration out of Africa. Now, previous to that, you can see it, at 100,000 years ago, there were people who went up into um, what's now Israel. And it's a very interesting uh, story because they, they find these uh, human fossils in Israel and they find them quite close to Neanderthal fossils. And so it's been a 
big, you know, was there intermarriage or interbreeding and apparently some. Um, but I think the bigger picture has to do with the ice age because as the ice came and went, the climates south of the ice changed. So you have these periods where uh, if the ice retreats to the north, then the sapiens can move farther north. And as the ice comes down from the north, the Neanderthals, which are, are more cold adapted, they move down into uh, places like Israel and uh, southern Spain and stuff. So uh, there's a lot of you know geology we have to look at and so on. Um, now, how do we study this stuff? Um, you know, I'll be talking about the anthropological part. There's definitely other things uh, about climate, paleoclimate, stuff like that. But these are sort of the standard uh, way of describing the fields of anthropology. Cultural anthropology is, you know, people go out like Margaret Mead and they live in a village and they talk to people and they figure out how the culture works. Um, we're going to look a little bit at the New Guinea uh, people and talk about their uh, cultural variation and um, and does that have any relevance to this question and you know uh, I think it does because we want to know how people function in tribal societies and um, these people we're talking about our ancient ancestors were probably in small bands you know maybe not even tribes so um, our understanding of how people operate in small-scale societies is important uh, contribution. Linguistic anthropology, um, we've got a lot of subfields there, um, but the key thing here uh, has to do with how languages change and then how they're related to each other in language families, because we get a lot of clues uh, about uh, migrations from language families. Uh, it's not gonna come up in this talk so much, but if we, uh, if we move to, uh, uh, other parts of the world, uh, we will see um, that, that that's a, a, a big part of it. Archaeology and prehistory, of course, um, finding sites, um, you know, uh, digging them up, dating them, uh, you know, who was living there, and hopefully find human remains that they can date and so on. And then uh, human evolution um, uh, or physical anthropology, um, there's a, a number of things that we deal with there, of course, fossils. And um, as I say, uh, for years, the definition of this field was really fossils. And uh, when I remember when the genetic stuff started to come on, all the fossil guys were, oh, no, you can't believe that genetic stuff. Oh, that's, you know, that's, how can they possibly blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, uh, the genetics has come a long, long way, in the course of my career. And now um, we we're discovering whole species based on the genetics, you know, <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. And then uh, human variation, the question of are there races, but you know, what is, what are the differences uh, between people and what is the cause? And of course we're uh, in all of this stuff, we're dealing with uh, Darwinian evolution. So, you know, I won't go into that here, but um, that kind of underlines everything. So I'm going to pause for questions. And so uh, what I want to do is stop share. And if I can do it. And so if you have a question, um, and you can either raise your hand like this, or you can. Um, or you can raise your hand technically, or you can unmute yourself. Are there, okay, Diane Fristrom has a question. Diane, will you unmute yourself? Diane, can you hear me? Okay, I've got it. There you go. There okay. You go. okay. Um, can you recommend some good reading material on this subject? Well, I'd be glad to send out some uh, reading. We sent out a couple with the uh, initial announcement, but um, you know, uh, why don't you take a look at the ones there, and you know, and then if you have other questions, uh, you could drop me an email. I'd be glad to recommend something. Roger, uh, I, I posted those those reference articles on the calendar. On the so calendar. You can go to the Ashby Village calendar, which you can. Do. Okay. 
Okay. Then click on that, yep. and down at the bottom is where all the where those two articles are listed. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Uh, Judy Tart has a question. Yeah, I'm interested in those little Hobbit people. How did they? It seems so different from everybody else. How did that happen? Well, of course, there's a lot of discussion about that, and it's been controversial, and there's accusations of hiding material. I'm, I'm bother you with all the stories, but um, it looks to me, I think the most logical thing is that very early, this is pre-humans, what we've been talking about so far is just about sapiens, right? Mm -hmm. But before sapiens left Africa, other hominids did, so uh, hominins, I should say. So you have the, the Homo erectus, and then Homo erectus's descendants, like the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, Mm -hmm. and maybe even something more primitive than Homo erectus, because the, the people in uh, Flores Island look pretty darn primitive. They look more like mm -hmm. Homo habilis, which is, you know, back uh, close to two million years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, you know, it's a very odd thing. And, but the second point is that they live on one of these islands in Indonesia, which when when they uh, the, were separated. So, you know, a lot of evolution, a lot of th interesting things happen on islands. It's a question of dispersals and how do species get from one to the other. And so how did they get there? And then they were the only uh, hominins there, so they did fine for a long time, but then eventually they died out. And uh, I guess people don't think that they were killed off by sapiens coming in. It's tempting to believe that, but um, anyway, they're, it's fascinating and, and yeah. just like I said, out of the blue. And they haven't been found anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Well, they did raise the question of would there be any other species uh, on any of those other islands? Mm -hmm. And some of them aren't very well discovered. I know there's a lot of work being done in uh, Sulawesi, which is another big island nearby. And I'm not sure what they found there, but they did find, I mentioned the one in the Philippines. Um, and so, and then in Philippines, they're while well, I'm on the Philippines, they also have these people they call Negritos, who are uh, a, apparently a very ancient group of people who uh, w went there at the time that the Australians and the New Guinea people went. So, uh, mm. you know, if you imagine these people going to Australia, uh, along the way, a lot of people said, no, we're fine here. And, you know, so, you know, there's been people that are dropped off here and there. <laughs> <laughs> along that journey. So apparently the Negritos are part of that. But yeah, it's it's so interesting and it's developing and um, we're going to find more. And, you know, that's it's, it's a really great subject. Thank you. Charlie? I, I have a question that's kind of about the anthropology of anthropology. Oh. <laughs> All through my life I've read occasional news about anthropology and every few years somebody would claim they've discovered an earlier version somewhere in our evolutionary chain. And there would always be incredibly fixed opposition to that. It's like, I never got the impression of any anthropologist who said, well, we've got good evidence for this main line and here's some evidence here. It might be interesting to follow up. It's always, no, that's impossible. This has got to be crappy work. But why such strong emotional involvement? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just curious. Well, I don't think we're unique in that regard, but uh, certainly is true. And I'll tell you, the uh, Stones and Bones guys really went down uh, hard when the genetics came in, because you know genetics is is a really tough subject, you know. And I I wouldn't know much about it if I if I weren't married to a biochemist. And um, you know, so along the line, I didn't start out learning genetics, you know, but along the line, I've had to learn a lot about it. Um, and fortunately, Audrey's got a doctorate in biochemistry, so she's been very helpful. But I think you can imagine somebody's in mid-career and they've made their mark by uh, studying old bones, and then somebody comes along and says, oh, yeah, we don't need the bones anymore. Now we can do genetics. And, it, you know, <laughs> uh, wait a minute. <laughs> But I do agree with you. Now, the other thing, if you could say about cultural anthropology, you know, we have this, what we call the my village syndrome. And so uh, somebody goes out and, and, uh, and, and learns about a village, you know, they live in, you know, Timbuktu or someplace. 
and then they uh, they they write about it, and they don't want any other anthropologists poaching on their territory, which of course is is unscientific. I mean, if they got if they found something, somebody else should be able to find it too. Uh, so anyway, it's um, I don't know. We need a psychologist, I guess, to help us with that one. I've seen that kind of pig-headedness in other fields of science, but I guess I always thought to be an anthropologist, you have to be transcending your own cultural biases and be open-minded about a lot of things. Yeah. Didn't look that way. No, no, I don't. I <laughs> anyway, mean, thank that's you. That's the ideal. Yeah. I think uh, Bertram, I said, good. I don't know. Yeah. Is it Dan? Oh. It's Will. Will. Oh, hi, Will. Hi. Uh, I know the cranium size varies with all these different species and subspecies, and, uh, including up to modern uh, humans, and we don't have the largest cranium, so I'm wondering if uh, you can equate intelligence at all with cranium size. Well, there definitely has been a selection for large brains, and, um, you know, it's really striking because um, the human species has uh, evolved to have such a large head that women have a hard time giving birth. Now you would might you might think that would be very anti-evolutionary. I mean, what's selective about killing off the mother? You know, so um, obviously the brain size has had a very very important effect, and we all think, of course, that it's related to culture, language, and so on. But um, you're right, the Neanderthals actually had a larger cranium. So it isn't just a matter of size, it's also a matter of the organization of the brain. And a lot of people think that there's stuff that doesn't come out in fossils, uh, which, you know, uh, like how do you, there's no fossil for language, you know? So, um, you know, we're, there are a lot of areas that, um, that we don't know but um, clearly brain size has been important, um, but not the only thing. It's also structure and all the connections and the, all the nerve stuff and all that, you know. So um, it's a pretty interesting subject, but I think that's going to get into, uh, I don't know, psychology or cog, what do they call it? Cog sci, cognitive science. So I think we ought to get back on it. Do you think, Audrey? Do we have more questions? Or more? Are there any more questions at this point? There will be other chances to um, to ask questions. Yeah, let me uh, go back to uh, my share screen here. All right, so then I want to talk about Australia a little bit here. So this is a picture of some um, Aboriginal people in Australia, these are uh, from Bathurst Islands in uh, north of uh, Darwin, or Darwin, as they say over there. Um, so clearly they're people, but they're, they do look different, and part of it is cultural. You can see some of them have a scarring on their chest, which is a probably member membership in a clan or something. Uh, so, um, but you know, when people went there and all over the world, when Europeans discovered all these different kinds of people, they wondered uh, what is there. Um, now, this is um, Mungo Lake, which is the uh, one of the most famous sites in Australia. I actually went there uh, several years ago, and this is pretty much what it looks like. And you think, oh my God, you know, how did they ever find anything there? But um, it, Mungo Lake is on an ancient tributary of the Murray River, which is the biggest river in Australia. I wouldn't say the only river in Australia, but pretty close to it. It's the only one that, you know, is a, I mean, it's a beautiful river. It used to be. Um, and it's the site of the discovery of Mungo Man. It's in uh, southwestern uh, New South Wales. And here's a picture of Mungo Man. Um, and he was, uh, he, he's been dated, there's controversy, but approximately 42,000 years ago. Uh, this is a long time ago. And uh, people were amazed. and. So uh, from this and from other um, evidence, um, uh, currently, I guess people would uh, say that 50,000 years for the first people coming to Australia is a ballpark, you know, probably uh, the right amount. And um, nowadays, we, uh, Aboriginal people are still with us 
although um, they've been very affected uh, by the colonization. Um, sad to say, uh, they've uh, been treated badly, like like the American Indians here, you know, put into reservations and tried to make them into, uh, you know, white Australian culture and so on like that. So, um, but still there is some, there are some uh, remnants, particularly in the Northern Territory uh, of uh, Aboriginal culture. And it's a very, very interesting culture. And we could go into that more, but we're not really on that one today. And then uh, this is just a uh, language families. And I just wanted to point out, now it's, it's current, situation. So all that green that you see is Indo-European. So that's English and Russian and um, Persian and uh, Hindu, Hindi and so on. So the, these Indo-European languages have taken over a lot of the globe. But you can still see uh, cultural variation. In Australia, um, the, um, there's sort of two major language groups. The ones in the north uh, apparently are, came there more recently. Um, and everywhere else is, is, the, is, is that what you see there in pink. But uh, previously they were, of course, more widely um, spread. But that's, you know, the language families give us some clues as to uh, migrations. And uh, here's a, um, uh, Elspeth Hayes is an uh, anthropologist, um, you know, uh, working on um, uh, material in a, in, a, in a rock shelter with the local Australian people. And um, I have to say, uh, give the Australians credit nowadays, for, they're very uh, concerned about, um, you know, uh, cultural remains and uh, want to bring in the, the local tribes and, you know, are we don't want to step on any toes and so on. So uh, um, it's a very um, sensitive and the same is true here with, um, with the Native American material. Uh, stone artifacts. Um, the Australian uh, Aboriginal culture uh, was really Stone Age, Paleolithic uh, culture. Um, the only, uh, you know, there, there are some clues about maybe proto-agriculture, kind of like what you get in, in uh, most of California, you know, but uh, for the most part, it was, it was um, hunting and gathering and, and, you know, that type of culture. And of course, they're famous for their boomerangs and their throwing sticks and stuff as they and their hunting. Um, now, New Guinea um, is a very much more uh, intact uh, culturally, particularly in the highlands. Um, New Guinea is the second largest island in the world. Uh, mountains go to 16,000 feet in the highlands. Uh, it's divided now between Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Um, Papua New Guinea is the country on the right in green, um, and the other end is, is Indonesian, um, called uh, West Papua. And uh, the Highland tribes there were discovered starting in the 1930s. So um, what you see in the dark color, the dark band down the middle are the, the mountains. And um, people didn't, you know, outsiders were uh, totally unaware that there were native people living up there until the 1930s. And it was a gold rush thing. The gold prospectors went up there and found them. And um, that's a really interesting subject uh, of a film called um, First Contact, if you ever want to watch a really cool film. Um, so, but, um, you know, there, the, the, the people, there's some difference, of course, between the coastal people and the Highlanders. And um, I'm just going to show some slides from when Audrey and I were there in 2005. Uh, the lowland people um, have more mix in their language and their genes and so on. So there's been contact, you know, but the Highlanders, uh, not so much. Now, here's um, just a few uh, pictures from the lowlands. Uh, I have to say, all the people in New Guinea are really fun people. And, you know, we really enjoyed our visit there. They were very interested in us. We were interested in them. You know, it was really fun. Um, this slide I just put in because you can see some features on the girl in the middle that, you know, suggest that she has some Asian uh, input into her uh, gene pool. So, so the, um, 
the lowland people are more mixed. Um, we uh, had a little fun with uh, bows and arrows there because uh, in the village, um, this is in the Arfak Mountains, the, um, <laughs> the villagers, uh, all, the men all carry bows and arrows because if those SOBs from the uh, neighboring uh, uh, valley want to come over here, they're going to get it, you know. So we said, no, no, we're not from the neighboring valley, you know, we're just, you know, tourists. So they said, okay, fine, fine. The guy on the left is Chris, is our, our guide. He's Indonesian, was unfortunately passed away, but uh, my friend Alec there, um, and then one of the local guys, so um, fun stuff. Now we go to the uh, mountains, and this is Wamena, which is the biggest town. It's in the highlands of uh, uh, West Papua in the Baliem Valley, about a mile high elevation. So it's very, it's much more comfortable, you know, tropical stuff. Uh, first seen by Europeans in 1938, and if you've seen the ethnographic film Dead Birds, um, I'm sure Gregory's seen this. Uh, Gregory's an uh, anthropolo anthropological uh, librarian and uh, he knows a lot about that stuff. So um, maybe we'll get him to give a talk in the future. Uh, so anyway, this is a, was really a, a, a treat for me because I kept seeing things that were reminiscent of that film. And so, um, you know, only since 1938, uh, uh, this is the scene at the airport. Uh, as we uh, were coming out of the airport, these are locals, uh, you know, the landing of an airplane is kind of a big deal. Uh, to, uh, it's only 30,000 people in this town. And um, this was one of the guys who uh, came to, to the airport and he's fully dressed. Um, you know, in that uh, culture, the Dani people, uh, they wear these uh, uh, gourds over their penis and they tie it up with a string because it's important for it to be erect. And um, so um, then uh, looking in the, uh, in the market, you know, went to the Wamena, market scene, you can see uh, the produce and stuff. And one of the things you start to notice is that, well, it's not all just native produce anymore. Uh, you know, they've, they've clearly, you know, some of them wearing uh, what we would call Western clothing. Uh, you know, they're not, uh, they're not uncontacted at this point for sure. Uh, but you know, the, then there's stuff that they do that, you know, they're sitting under the table. And, you know, I was just thought, huh. Well, I guess that's another place you could sit and have your wares out, you know, so uh, that's fine. Now this guy, a um, couple of things about uh, his appearance. Um, the red, uh, probably some of you recognize is uh, from betel nut. And uh, betel nut is widely uh, used as a mild narcotic in throughout uh, Southeast Asia. And, uh, but he's, you know, really interested in us and uh, the yellow uh, plumes that you see there are from bird of paradise. And so as birders, you know, we don't like to see the birds, you know, used for props in their costume, but uh, it's traditional that they do. So uh, anyway, here he is in the market in Wamena. And uh, these women are showing us their fingers uh, because uh, the tradition is that when a uh, male relative dies, uh, close, uh, female relatives uh, have a, a joint or two lopped off of a finger, and so uh, you can see they, you know, they've all got uh, short, shortened fingers, and um, sure. so um, you know, you see that in the film Dead Birds. It's you know happening, or at least happened in the lifetime of these women, and you know, I think in some of the remote areas, probably still happening. Uh, so here's uh, go, going uh, out to the uh, IK River, which is uh, uh, flows there, and uh, Marie on the left is uh, our friend uh, and fellow uh, companion. And here's her husband, Alec, with uh, one of the local guys. And uh, here's Audrey, um, uh, probably politically incorrect, but I like to call this photo uh, Snow White and, and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> uh, because uh, <laughs> the people are short, you know, so, uh, but uh, totally friendly and uh, fun to meet. Um, here's a guy, he's got his key around his neck. Um, and uh, here's a couple of uh, overdressed uh, white women uh, with uh, two of the native women in front of one of the traditional houses. Now this guy, uh, I was very uh, taken with this photo because uh, not only it shows off his penis cord, but um, 
he's planting rice. You know, now rice is a new thing. I mean, the Indonesians brought in the rice. So it just shows that cultures will change and adapt. You know, uh, people learn new stuff. So it isn't all going to be uh, uh, traditional, but it's a mix. You know, people uh, change and uh, adopt stuff. And he was actually um, excited to see us. He came charging out of the water uh, because he expected a tip. And so uh, our guide uh, slipped him a few bills and put it in his wristband so that he didn't get it all muddy. And um, we uh, went on the way. Now, uh, we're there on a birding expedition, fabulous birds, birds of paradise. It's really a wonderful place. And uh, so here we're sharing the bird book with some of the locals. And um, they're very, very interested. And they like birds too. And they can help, oh, we saw that bird. We saw it over there. And, and so on. Uh, and here is uh, Chris is right in the bottom, in the middle there. And he's um, got his camera and is showing the pictures to uh, the kids. But you attract a crowd everywhere you go. Uh, people were just as interested in us as we were in them. And I just thought it was kind of cool. One guy brought his ukulele and another guy is obviously older, uh, traditional, and uh, he doesn't see any reason to give up the puma sword. Uh, but the kids, you know, are changing. They're um, wearing the Western clothing. So uh, let's see. Let's pause for questions and comments about that. Um, there aren't any in the chat, but maybe people have questions. Um, okay. You, can you know what? I'm having a hard time. I've got a question uh, for Celia. I'm having a hard time getting my pointer to work. Uh, it's annotate. It's like a, what's that? You mean the annotate feature? Well, just to move my pointer around. I don't see my pointer. Your cursor? My cursor, yeah. So, I don't know. Well, we, it's not essential. I can, I can do without that. What are you trying to point out? Well, on the slide, I want to, you know, uh, use it. Anyway, so any questions so far about all that? You know, so far, okay. All right, so let's go. Uh, oh, wait, Janet, um, Janet's friend. Oh, yeah, Will. Unmute, Janet, unmute yourself. Okay. How many languages uh, are in the New Guinea group, you think? Well, that's one of the most diverse uh, language uh, uh, families in the world. Um, there's, there's sort of two, it's interesting because California, California Indians also had very, very diverse uh, languages. What ha that comes about, of course, with the long occupation, but then uh, with all the little valleys and, you know, each, they're all fighting against each other. So the languages uh, change. And, and so there, you see figures like 800 languages and stuff like that. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible, the lingu linguistic diversity. But um, what happens is then you, uh, once you establish contact, people are gonna uh, have to uh, get some kind of a pigeon, you know, or a trade language or, you know, something. So in uh, Papua New Guinea, they use uh, talk pisin, which is a uh, New Guinea uh, Indonesian pigeon. And it's actually English. And uh, we could learn to use some of it we, when we were there. Um, it isn't so hard to learn, which is whole, that's the point, you know, a simplified language. In um, Indonesia, uh, they use a Bahasa Indonesia, which is uh, uh, the lingua franca of Indonesia, and it's the official language, you know, because Indonesia is full of all these different islands and tribes and people and languages. I mean, it's a very, very diverse uh, 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 set of islands, so, so they have this... Uh, uh, it's based on Malay, and so Malay is the, the language family from Malaya. It's essentially the same language as, uh, as Malay, as it, you use in Malaysia. Uh, so, uh, so that's a uh, lingua franca. Okay, any... Um... Yeah, I just noticed that um, some people had shoes on, a few. Mm -hmm. Some didn't. Was there anything about that, or is it just a matter of what they can afford? Or yeah, 
Well, of course, traditionally they didn't wear shoes. And um, the fact is that if you don't wear shoes, your, your feet toughen up. And so not only do they toughen up, but they splay out. And so um, if you're, it's, it's, it's difficult because if you then want to wear shoes and you don't have the feet for it, uh, they hurt. <laughs> so, um, you know, people, a lot of times if they live in a village, they don't wear shoes, but then they think, oh, if I go to town, uh, I don't want to be seen as a country bumpkin. So they, they uh, get shoes and, they, and then they hobble around in their shoes. You know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's a good and bad about shoes. Uh, yeah. You know, we have, we're so adapted to shoes that when we go barefoot, you know, we're, we're stumbling around, we can't do it. So it's an uh, interesting thing. Okay. All right. So there's one more question from oh. um, Susan Newman. Okay. Are the modern or Aboriginal peoples unhappy about getting genetic testing, like many Native Americans? Right. Good point. Um, yeah. So especially in Australia, it's it's uh, very uh, tricky, and um, so it's a very delicate uh, question. It's true here among Native Americans. Uh, some of them, not all. But um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a question that um, people have to be very sensitive about, and um, so um, in in some in some of the studies you read, and they'll say, well, uh, we couldn't get DNA because you know so so it is an it is a, a shortcoming. We uh, I'll just say that generally, yeah. That's it from here. Okay. All right. So now the last part is I'm going to show this video, which some of you have seen. Um, but what I'd like to do is to, um, to uh, stop it. Oh, no, I've got another section, don't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I did. This is, a, I, I really like this section of the slideshow. <laughs> Okay, so this is this. Oh, good, my cursor's working. So this is the. Um, oh, I see. The problem is if I hit play. Is there any way you could expand that for us? Yeah. So yeah, the problem is you know, my cursor works here, uh, but it doesn't work when I blow it up. But I'll blow it. Up. I'll just point out. This is what I'm talking about in these islands. Okay, so then I'll. I can I'll see your cursor, Raj. Yeah, but you you can't see it when it's blown up like that's that. better. I can see it. It's can better see, now. You can see the cursor? Yes, yeah, we see it. Oh my. You can't see it? Oh. <laughs> well, that's oh, oh well. Okay. Well, anyway, the Wallace's line, this was uh first uh discovered uh by uh Alfred Russell Wallace, who is the co discoverer of evolution along with Darwin. And he's one of the more fascinating figures in the history of science because uh, he spent years on these islands after he spent years in the Amazon jungle. I mean, this guy was a fanatic and um, he didn't have any money. So he had to uh, collect beetles and send them back, you know, make money that way and stuff like that. But anyway, the Wallace's line divides two faunal uh, uh, provinces. So what that means is to the southeast of this line are the animals that you would find in Australia and New Guinea. So like kangaroos and stuff like that. And to the northwest of the line are placental mammals that you would find, um, you know, in Asia or in Europe, in Eurasia. So, um, so anyway, here's a picture of uh, some of these animals. I can't get see my cursor, but now the, 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 this is a little, there's a couple of them that shouldn't be here for this talk because they're from New Zealand. New Zealand's different. Okay, so strike New Zealand. Uh, but most of them are Australian. So you see kangaroos, you see possum, bird of paradise. And the big bird behind the kangaroo is a cassowary. Oh no, there's a, that's, yeah, that looks like a cassowary. No, the cassowary is under the tiger wolf. Yeah, under the, under the marsupial tiger, there's a cassowary. Um, it's a huge bird. Um, you want to be careful when you're around this guy. Um, and then you can see echidna and, and a platypus and so on. So 
So the, these animals um, are limited to Australia and New Guinea. And the reason is because of the, 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 uh, the water. The water is so deep that even in the ice age, when, when sea level was lower, uh, there wasn't a connection. They, they couldn't get across. So it's a, it's, a, it's a dispersal issue, you know, and they couldn't disperse across Wallace's line. Um, and then conversely, on the Asian side, you have these um, uh, placental mammals, you know, pigs, uh, cats, um, dogs, and moose, and bison, all that sort of stuff. You know, these are all uh, Eurasian animals. Um, this is a little bit uh, more complex. I don't want to get into all these different lines, you know, but uh, fundamentally, Wallace's, uh, the modification of his concept, this is 1859, so naturally we've learned more since. Now what they talk about is Wallacea as a province. There you see it in the middle. Uh, it's a province of its own and it has inputs from both sides. So some of these islands, like for example, Sulawesi, which is the big one on the left of Wallacea, uh, that uh, they have tarsiers there, which are primates. You know, they're uh, little, they're not even monkeys, they're, they're primitive primates. Um, and they have pigs, they have this thing called the babirusa. There's a lot of oddities in, in the birds. Of course, the birds are another story because some birds could fly and some couldn't. And so there's a lot of things to it. But Wallacea is this very, very interesting province, especially for bird watchers, because there's all these islands and separate evolution, and you know, it just goes on and on. But the, the, the point is, people had to get across this water, and they must have had boats, okay? So our ancestors, or the ancestors of the Australians came down here, and they got across, uh, the Wallacea, and if you see on this one, let's see, uh, this one, no, no, I don't have that. Yeah. Oh, now you can see between uh, Sunda on the left and Saho on the right. And so you can see that the, the sea level is lower. New, New Guinea is connected to Australia and to some of the other islands, but there still are gaps. So um, yes, it was a little bit easier, but, but still. Uh, so this is really fascinating. These and 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 even some of the more primitive ones, like I mentioned about the um, the uh, Flores Flores man, the, the the hobbits. You know, they're very primitive and they got across. So clearly, uh, animals and people can disperse uh, in ways that that we usually don't give them credit for. So anyway, that's the Wallacea thing. And um, do we have Yes, questions? there is a question, Roger. Oh, okay. There's a question about skin color from Irene. Is there a relationship between the time people left Africa and their skin color? Um, I don't think that's really quite the way to look at it. Um, I think that you have to uh, realize that um, we don't have very much hair. And um, Apparently, people evolved in Africa to be hairless or not much hair. Now, what that does, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of theories about that, but I think it has to do with uh, heat loss. That um, you know that you if you can sweat, we're the sweatiest species on the you know to sweat like a pig would be to sweat less than a human. So uh, people are sweaty, and the reason is we, in in the tropics, you need to be able to lose heat. If you're going to be out on the, you know, otherwise you have to lay low during the day and then just be out in the morning, the evening, and stuff. Oh. So, um, so we lost our hair. Okay. So then, uh, the 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 skin is, you know, light skin is really. I mean, if any of you ever go to the dermatologist, you know that light skin is not necessarily a, a that great of a thing. And so, um, you know, light skin uh, was selected out, and people were dark. Probably before we lost our hair, the skin was kind of neutral, kind of, at least with the chimpanzee, it's, it's fairly light. Uh, but um, once you lose your hair, then you got to have dark skin. So with rapid selection in favor of uh, melanin production to darken the skin. Now, the, So anybody in the tropics, you know, is well served to have dark skin. 
and uh, even farther north uh, if you if you're exposed a lot no so uh, like on australia i mean australia all these uh, irish people down there you know they're all getting skin cancer you know so in australia they wear these broad brim hats and you know the kids taught to use sunscreen and, you know it's a big deal because there's a lot of sunshine in australia it's pretty dry and pretty so um so anyway, the skin color is a very rapidly evolving trait that when you go far north, um, then you need the light skin to uh, get your vitamin D. That's one of the main, there's other things too, but, but um, the vitamin D is the main thing. So then light skin evolves among uh, northern people. But uh, the base, you know, the earlier one is dark. So that's going to be anybody in the tropics who you know, like the average. That's it for here. Okay. All right. So uh, we're moving right along and we're going to start the video now. Hopefully I'm going to be able to stop this. But like I say, I've got a little cursor problem. If I can't stop it, I may go to the other view. See there I can see it. So Okay, so uh, just to, to mention, I, I did say that the 200,000, now they've got some people up here in Morocco that seem to have uh, contributed, but uh, the 200,000 in Ethiopia, that has to do with um, mitochondrial Eve, you might remember back in the 80s, uh, they, just, they, they did genetic studies. It's controversial about, you know, the South Africans all think that it's this cradle mankind thing down here by uh, Johannesburg. I think they're, you know, I think it's Ethiopia, but you know, uh, <laughs> this field's developing. But anyway, so first sapiens, uh, pretty much in Africa, in, well, in Africa, but in East Africa seems to be uh, critical. So of course they migrate out and you know occupy gut fossils around different parts. Uh, but notice this cold, dry period. Now what this means is that there it's a, it's a selection event. It means that there's a, a, a strong selection, and so you have rapid evolution. You know if there isn't something that you have to get past, you know same old same old works. But if you have a really tough situation uh then you know only the strong are going to survive well only the strong strong at what you know so um so what we think is that um, some subset of these early uh sapiens gained an advantage of some sort and you know there's a lot of talk about was it um, they got more social or they learned more language or um or what you know but what i think is one of the things is a coastal adaptation and i'm going to argue in favor of of a dispersal along the coast and the reason that i argue for that is that if you learn to exploit marine resources um, you're going to find food all along the coast it's a great avenue and so whereas if you go across you know the mountains and the valleys and so on uh, the animals change and you, you're in a uh, different terrain but a coastal environment is relatively similar and notice that these this is uh coastal uh in the tropics so it's a tropical coastal ecosystem that works all the way down here into Saho and in, in, into uh, into uh Australia and New Guinea. So I think that this, they call it a bottleneck, a genetic bottleneck, meaning that some small subset got an advantage. Maybe they, you know, why did they become more migratory? You know, there's questions, but uh, that seems to be a critical thing that we had this challenge, you know, this cold, dry period. Okay, so leaving Africa, 
Um, 60,000 is probably a ballpark, you know, that a lot of people would say, well, approximately. And did they cross here? They had to cross water to get from Africa to Arabia. Um, and this is sort of schematic, you know, they just have this arrow going like that. My opinion is they probably went along the coast. And then even though, you know, it's cold, dry period, you can't imagine that they had much to eat in the middle of uh, Arabia. But, you know, climate probably was different in those days. But, um, but they had to get across water here. Uh, it, it's, it was narrower, and, but there are islands, you know, so maybe it wasn't so hard to do it. But these are adventurous people. And, you know, people are, you know, we're an adventurous species. So here we see them coming down into the expanded Southeast Asia. So what's uh, a lot of these islands are now part of the continent. And then they come down here and they have to get across uh, into uh, Australia and again. So there you see, this is one big continent uh, at that time. And so people come in and again, you know, I believe that they dispersed around the coast and down here, uh, the Murray River comes out at Adelaide, which I think is around here someplace. And, but if you went up the uh, Murray, uh, you would get up to where Mungo Man is. Mungo Man's up in here. And so, uh, you know, that's my guess is that they came around and then up. Now, of course, people in Australia today, uh, there are people out in the outback, of course, all over the place, but it's tough. And I think, you know, that probably developed later. So then we have other groups coming out and, and populating other parts of Asia. So um, Africa is our origin. Eurasia is, I mean, mostly Asia. And I see we haven't gotten to Europe yet, uh, but there are people coming down into Asia in various different groups. And, and they can trace this genetically with what they call haplogroups. So these are probably the ancestors of the Dravidian people, which are the older population in, in, uh, in India. And we can, in some other talk, we could go into some of these other ones, but um, just... So this is pretty interesting now, these various lines leading into Europe and um, some of them from Central Asia, and it seems to be a major source, and then some of them coming across the north, and this would probably be the ancestors of the Finns and the Hungarians, judging from um, uh, linguistics. Uh, so, uh, so here Europe's got a lot of inputs, and that's a really fascinating topic uh, to get into. Maybe. So Neanderthals go extinct. Now the Neanderthals did live in Europe before the Europeans got there. Uh, uh, the Sapiens uh, took over and whether there was much fighting doesn't seem to be. It seems to be that the Sapiens just were more adaptive and took over the habitat. Here you can see the ice coming down. So here you see these uh, different, there are a couple of different uh, groups coming across the Bering Strait. And again, language gives us some clues and genetics gives us some clues. But notice that the ice is really coming down. So sea level's lower and uh, Beringia emerges from, from the water. So they could actually walk across here. And in fact, uh, lived in this area for a long time before they were able to get farther south because that was uh, kind of blocked.
Okay, so um, that's it. Um, we and, have a question from Audrey. Okay. Audrey, Audrey unmute yourself. Hi, I sent you a chat. I had actually two questions. One of them was, um, when did the coastal people of Southern Africa live? They were the ones who lived in the caves, uh -huh. uh, very close to the water. Mm -hmm. Remember? Yeah, yeah. I'd have to check the dates. I don't, don't have it in my head right now, but people did disperse around Africa. You know, one thing that uh, people here tend to think, oh, well, Africa, then they're, they're, that's a continent occupied by Africans. Well, um, it's, it's the most diverse po uh, population in the world. I mean, no continent is more diverse than Africa. And yet we just think, oh, well, they're just all Africans living over there. Well, uh, yeah, but um, that's, Africa is fascinating because they've all these different language families and uh, different inputs. Um, just to give you a little uh, taste, um, when I'm, I'm a volunteer at the Academy of Sciences, or I was, and I hope to be able to get back someday. And uh, the uh, curator of anthropology there, uh, until recently, uh, was a man uh, from Ethiopia. And he's a, a paleoanthropologist, and he's made a lot of discoveries, and um, you know, really interesting guy. And so, um, you know, we've had some talks, and um, so we were asking him about his uh, his genes, you know, like because the, the the rule of thumb is that when people left Africa, they encountered these more primitive groups like the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, and they interbred with them, and so uh, most of us have some degree of African of a Neanderthal uh, genes in our genome. And I've had mine tested, and you can get it tested, and I have something like 2.8% Neanderthal, and people speculate on which traits uh, of mine are caused by these Neanderthal genes. And, you know, there's a really interesting subject about, you know, what, what was so good about these Neanderthal genes. Uh, but anyway, it should not apply to Africans, because it, the Neanderthals were in Europe and, and, and Western Asia. Uh, however, um, our uh, curator from Ethiopia, he said that he actually had some Neanderthal genes. And so how could that be? Well, it's probably from back migration. And if you, I'm sure people have been to Ethiopian restaurants and looked at Ethiopians and, you know, uh, they don't look like West Africans, you know, they, they're dark skinned, not very dark, but sort of dark. And yet they seem to have sometimes some Caucasian features. So uh, apparently um, Caucasian types are, you know, of course these labels are a little odd, but that, in other words, there's some back migration and some Neanderthal genes got into, so there are places in Africa where they have some much less Neanderthal uh, genes. So I don't know, I find it fascinating that uh, how people moved around and uh, how we find out about it and so on. Yeah, Audrey? So I have another question, and that is, uh, you mentioned the Dravidians in India. Yeah. And they look a lot like the Australian Aborigines and also the New Guinea people. And yet they only, uh, well, the fossils that we have are only from 35,000 years ago. So how is that explained when the the um, the Australians and the Ab and the New Guineans or the Papuans migrated so much earlier. Right. So apparently, what happened, um, you know, big picture here, is that um, the migration from Africa to Australia probably not huge numbers of people, you know, and it probably. I believe that they went along the coastal route, and I believe that um, the resources were probably hard to find. And you know, they didn't have; they weren't deep sea fishermen or anything. You know, so they had to rely on mussels and stuff along the shore, and so that's limited. And they probably um, used up resources pretty quickly, and there was an incentive to keep moving. And 
knowing human nature, uh, they probably got into squabbles, you know, and um, <laughs> they probably, uh, you know, said, uh, I'm, I'm getting the hell out of here, you don't like me. You know, uh. And so, <laughs> I mean, that's just people, right? And when you see in New Guinea, these guys carrying bows and arrows, you know, you, you know that stuff happens. So anyway, I think they probably rapidly uh, dispersed. Now, as they went along, of course, it doesn't mean that, that this is one group that went to Australia and nobody, probably along the way, they, because they, there's some very interesting sites um, I was reading about in, I think it was in India, where, where they, um, the earlier sites were on the coast and then the later sites were in the interior. And uh, so people would break off, learn about the interior, and gradually uh, uh, settle in that area. And so, and then later, when you had, you know, that other uh, line that I pointed out was uh, the Dravidians, you know, they came out of Africa later. They're also dark skinned. And um, uh, so they probably mixed some with the, these earlier people. So it's very interesting to look in the genetics of people in India for Australian type genes. And there, there are some studies that find that. And pretty much it's gonna be among your tribal people. Um, you know, in India, I mean, it's very complex, but they have always different castes and stuff and the untouchables. And, uh, and one, of their, uh, one of their categories is, is tribals. So tribals are sort of separate from the caste system. They're people that live up in the mountains or you know, they never were absorbed into the caste system. And so some of these tribals do look, uh, have some genes that are left over from that early migration. Roger, Susan has a question about um, the Neanderthals. How do we know anything about the migration routes of the Neanderthals? Wow. Well, um, we know uh, kind of the areas that their fossils have been found. So they've been found, they're known mo more from Europe than from anywhere else. And it's partly because there's been more archeology span done in Europe. So you, you have to say, well, maybe that's not the whole story. Uh, but then they've been found uh, in uh, Eastern Europe and even into Western Asia. There's famous ones from uh, Iraq, um, and even in uh, the Denisova cave, which is now in, is in Russia, it's in Central Asia, um, they're found both Neanderthals and uh, Denisovans there. And in fact, they've even found uh, uh, some DNA of a person that was a hybrid between those two kinds of people. So you have a, you have a, a map with sites on it where we found these remains, right? So you, you know more or less where, the limits of where they lived approximately. Now, how they migrated there, um, I don't think, I don't know anybody's approached that question. I don't know. So maybe we need a PhD topic, you know, maybe you could go study that, I don't know. <laughs> Stump me on that one. That's so, it here. Yeah. So anybody else? Um, okay. So, uh, oh yeah, Will's oh. got his hand up. Yeah, uh, this uh, migration along the seashores uh, included a steady diet of seafood. And mm -hmm. uh, also in Europe, there was a lot of uh, salmon running up the rivers and people right. uh, fish their diet. Uh, is there any speculation on how that affected human uh, biological development? I'm not aware of it, but it probably there is. The, the thing that it, uh, there is that I, I could mention um, is about the, um, the types of uh, calcium that are in teeth. And you know, the, what, what's so fascinating about this field is everybody's got some little avenue to try to figure stuff out. And so they can actually take old teeth and um, you know, teeth are the most commonly found fossils. It's the hardest part of your body. So we have teeth, okay? If we don't have anything else, we have teeth. Uh, so you can study the teeth and you can find out some clues about what they ate because there's different isotopes of chemicals that are in there. And uh, 
And so, I mean, I'd have to research it to give you more detail, but the other thing about the teeth that I find fascinating is, you know, people say, well, can you get DNA from these ancient fossils? Well, uh, you know, when they got them from the Neanderthals, that was considered amazing, you know, because these were like 40,000 or more years old. And so how did it get preserved? And the story for a long time was that the DNA preserved in cold, dry situations, so like in a cave or something, um, but not in the tropics, you know? And so uh, we don't have a lot of, and we don't have, fossils don't preserve very well in, in the tropics, so, that, so that's a limitation. But, um, they have the oldest uh, DNA, I think, that they have is something like 700,000 years, which is a huge number, uh, from uh, uh, a horse that was frozen in the permafrost in, in uh, Russia. And when they dug it up, they were able to extract enough DNA. Now, what happens there is it's not necessarily intact. You know, it's not like you get a full genome the first time you try it. But what they do is they get bits and pieces, and then they compare it to a modern horse in this case. Uh, they, would, they, they line up the sequences uh, next to a modern one. And so then you can put together a composite. You can get a pretty good picture. I mean, it's not gonna be perfect, but they have some DNA from horses. And sometimes uh, you don't have to have the whole thing. You just need little markers. Uh, so the markers um, might tell you uh, if who's related to who, you know. So that that's one of the things, uh, you know. Like for example, nowadays people want to know their ancestry, and they they want to know like um, where in Africa did my ancestors come from, or where in Europe did my ancestors come from. Well, you can actually uh, increasingly it's a, it's a very growing field, you know. But you can go to Twenty Three and Me as a site, for example, or the Human Genome Project. And you can um, get, um, send in your, your DNA, you spit in a tube and send it, and uh, they um, can tell you uh, with increasing accuracy, you know, maybe what part of, maybe what tribe, you know. Uh, it's a very, very interesting. But so the DNA, but actual ancient DNA uh, in human, in, in, in our, uh, family, let's say, um, actually ancestors of the, of the Neanderthals, they have from Spain 430,000. So they're pushing the, uh, the frontiers of this stuff incredibly. Now when they get beyond that, <clears throat> they use this thing called proteomics, which is where they analyze the proteins. Because if you don't have the DNA, maybe you have uh, the proteins of, from uh, tooth enamel, for example. And so uh, they get these ancient, they, they've got stuff from over a million years where they don't have the DNA, but if you know the proteins, you can reverse engineer because the DNA is a code to make proteins. And so if you know the protein, you can go backwards somewhat, you know, there's tricks to it, but you can go backwards and figure out the DNA. Now you might not be able to get a full genome. You might be able to just get the code for that particular type of tooth enamel or something. But then if you have a bunch of teeth from other places and you do the same thing with those teeth, you can get some clues as to who's related to whom and how they uh, spread around. So it's just all these little clues that you try to make it all add up. And uh, one of the fascinating things about um, when I taught this field, you know, everybody wants to have a complete story. They want to know, well, okay, what's the story? You know, I mean, we, we, we love stories, right? And I'll say, well, I'll be glad to tell you a story. And uh, it's the story that uh, we have today, right? I mean, this is the current story. But come back tomorrow, I said, you, you're going to have to retake my class because, you know, the story's going to change. And uh, so anyway, I find it really fascinating to, to uh, follow this material. And um, I was... Uh, uh, very uh, grateful to be able to um, have an excuse to put this talk together because it forced me to go back and look, you know, what, what have they found here and what have they found there. And uh, so I hope it's been as interesting to you as it is to me. I, 
Um, Jack, I mean, um, Roger, there are a number of, of thank yous in the chat. Oh, oh okay. Well, thank you uh, for uh, um, participating. And I guess if I go down to these messages, I'll see that. Yeah. If you want to unmute, Audrey, maybe someone else wants to unmute everyone. Maybe there are other people who would like. Or make comments, you know. That, um, you have a question or a comment, or you have a thought about some of these things that have been presented. Please unmute yourself and speak up. Or maybe some other topics for the science and ideas group. Of things you'd be interested in. Yeah. Well, while you're thinking up your topic that you're going to lead us on, <laughs> um, I would uh, like to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do next time. We're going to do something a little different. Um, we're going to do a um, name stories. What, what's in a name? Uh, a lot of us have um, strange um, stor stories about how we or someone else got a name. So what we would like for people to do is to write a little, you know, short um, thing on your name, and uh, then we will. If you know if there are too many, then we'll have to select. But we can read your uh, your name story, or you can come and read your name story. But we'd like it'd be sure nice if you would let us see your name story before the time, so we can see whether it's publishable. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but anyway, that's what we're going to do next time. So uh, think and that date and that date. Then uh, that's going to be the. Yeah, the second, second Wednesday? Wednesday of the month, whatever that is. The 14th, the second Wednesday. Is it the 14th? Okay, is it the, second? That be the 14th. Um, we'll have something in the uh, calendar about that. Um, you all know how to get to the Ashby Village calendar and find that date and click on the thing. That's how you also can get the uh, Zoom, Zoom uh, link too. So, um, did anybody think up a topic that they want to have or would like to lead us in? Something that you're interested in now? Oh, Will, yes. Uh, I'd like to hear more from Roger about uh, linguistic uh, evidence towards uh, human migrations and how that overlaps with the genetic. Uh... Yeah, I'd love to do that. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I think it's totally fascinating. Yeah, it might yeah. be something from the Central Asia because that's a place Audrey and I've been going the last few years. So, hey, stay tuned. <laughs> so, Roger, there's one other question um, from Susan Newman saying, last name or first name, or maybe that's to you, Audrey. Well, it can be either. If you have an interesting last name development, go ahead. Interesting first name development, yes. Middle name, yes. <laughs> yeah, this topic uh, kind of came up uh, in my, uh, I have a Tuesday uh, sort of uh, former colleagues and friends, uh, we meet for Tuesday lunch every, it's been doing for years. But anyway, one of the uh, members uh, confessed that uh, he's uh, been uh, uh, living under an assumed name for uh, 50 years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I thought, oh, is this some kind of witness protection program? Or <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was um, he told us his grandfather was from some little village in eastern Poland, and he spoke some dialect of Polish. And when uh, he was a teenager, the Tsar, Tsar uh, uh, army came and recruited him. And uh, so he went into the, to the Russian army and they said, uh, uh, what's your name? And he said, in this dialect, I don't understand. And then they kept asking him and he kept saying, I don't understand. What, I don't know how you say that in this Polish dialect. But So uh, anyway, they said, okay, uh, that's, who, that's who you are. You're I don't understand. Because they didn't know Polish and that they just wrote it down. Okay, that's his name. And so his grandfather came over and, and my friend was, uh, that was his name when he was growing up and he got to be uh, a young man and he said, screw this, I don't want to be have that name. <laughs> so he just 
found a name and he said, uh, okay, I'm gonna have this other name. So, I mean, there's so many interesting stories about names in, in our, our culture because I, I guess I have this view of uh, the United States as the place where people start over. You know, it's like uh, whatever stupid junk was going on back home, you can just say, the hell with that, I'm out of here, you know, and I'm going to go start over. And, like you know, you become a new that, man. what's that? Like they become a new man. They become a new man. Yeah, I guess that's what my ancestors did. <laughs> Oh, Roger. Uh, Gregory, has Gregory, a, has a, Gregory, has a, Gregory has a question. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Gregory. Well, you I was go. just going to follow up on that wonderful story of Rogers. And I did my research, most of it in Burkina Faso in West Africa, which was one of the very last places in the interior of Africa to be conquered by Europeans. The French mm. conquered it in 1896, 97. Mm. And when they did, they did it, they literally conquered the place. And so, you know, their reputation preceded them. So they arrived at a, what is today, a medium-ish regional town in Burkina Faso. Most people fled ahead of them. So the story goes that there was only an old woman who was too feeble to move who left there when the French of their African troops arrived. And so they demanded of her, what is this place? Hmm. And the name of the town was Salamatenga, which happens to mean city of gold. And what, what she said was Kaya Salamatenga, which means this is city of gold. But that was too long for the French to deal with. So what they wrote down, and to this day, the name of the town is Kaya, which just means this is. <laughs> <laughs> Same phenomenon. Uh -huh. Right. Well, there's tons of really fun stories like that. Um, there's one. Uh, Roger, I hope we'll, we will be able to get some more of these stories next time. Yeah, we're uh, out of time, I know. Hold your story until next time. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna recruit. We 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 just want people to send in a brief thing of your story, and then uh, we'll you know uh, try to have a session on names next time. So anyway, that's a heads up. Well, thank you very much, um, all of you, for coming, for participating, for asking questions, for making comments. We really like that. Um, and we hope to see you and hear from you again. Thanks, okay. Roger. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Roger. No, thank Thanks, you. Roger. All right. Welcome. And do look at the chats because there's so many thank yous in it. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. What a rich afternoon. What a rich afternoon. <laughs> Damn. Ending it all. <laughs> not fair, Audrey. Not fair. Not, not all, Audrey. <laughs> <laughs>